Law 17. Keep others in suspense. Cultivate an air of unpredictability. Judgment. Humans are creatures of habit with an insatiable need to see familiarity in other people's actions. Your predictability gives them a sense of control. Turn the tables. Be deliberately unpredictable. Behavior that seems to have no consistency or purpose will keep them off balance, and they will wear themselves out trying to explain your moves. Taken to an extreme, this strategy can intimidate and terrorize. Observance of the Law In May of 1972, chess champion Boris Spassky anxiously awaited his rival Bobby Fischer in Reykjavik, Iceland. The two men had been scheduled to meet for the World Championship of Chess, but Fischer had not arrived on time, and the match was on hold. Fischer had problems with the size of the prize money, problems with the way the money was to be distributed, problems with the logistics of holding the match in Iceland. He might back out at any moment. Spassky tried to be patient. His Russian bosses felt that Fischer was humiliating him and told him to walk away. But Spassky wanted this match. He knew he could destroy Fischer, and nothing was going to spoil the greatest victory of his career. So it seems that all our work may come to nothing, Spassky told a comrade. But what can we do? It is Bobby's move. If he comes, we play. If he does not come, we do not play. A man who is willing to commit suicide has the initiative. Fischer finally arrived in Reykjavik, but the problems and the threat of cancellation continued. He disliked the hall where the match was to be fought. He criticized the lighting. He complained about the noise of the cameras. He even hated the chairs in which he and Spassky were to sit. Now the Soviet Union took the initiative and threatened to withdraw their man. The bluff apparently worked. After all the weeks of waiting, the endless and infuriating negotiations, Fischer agreed to play. Everyone was relieved. No one more than Spassky, but on the day of the official introductions, Fischer arrived very late, and on the day when the match of the century was to begin, he was late again. This time, however, the consequences would be dire. If he showed up too late, he would forfeit the first game. What was going on? Was he playing some sort of mind game, or was Bobby Fischer perhaps afraid of Boris Spassky? It seemed to the assembled Grand Masters and to Spassky that this young kid from Brooklyn had a terrible case of the jitters. At 5.09, Fisher showed up exactly one minute before the match was to be canceled. The first game of a chess tournament is critical since it sets the tone for the months to come. It is often a slow and quiet struggle, with the two players preparing themselves for the war and trying to read each other's strategies. This game was different. Fischer made a terrible move early on, perhaps the worst of his career, and when Spassky had him on the ropes, he seemed to give up. Yet Spassky knew that Fischer never gave up. Even when facing checkmate, he fought to the bitter end, wearing the opponent down. This time, though, he seemed resigned. Then, suddenly, he broke out a bold move that put the room in a buzz. The move shocked Spassky, but he recovered and managed to win the game. But no one could figure out what Fischer was up to. Had he lost deliberately? Or was he rattled? Unsettled? Even as some thought, insane? After his defeat in the first game, Fisher complained all the more loudly about the room, the cameras, and everything else. He also failed to show up on time for the second game. This time, the organizers had had enough. He was given a forfeit. Now he was down two games to none, a position from which no one had ever come back to win a chess championship. Fisher was clearly unhinged. Yet, in the third game, as all those who witnessed it remember, he had a ferocious look in his eye, a look that clearly bothered Spassky. And despite the hole he had dug for himself, he seemed supremely confident. He did make what appeared to be another blunder, as he had in the first game, but his cocky air made Spassky smell a trap. 
Yet, despite the Russian suspicions, he could not figure out the trap, and before he knew it, Fisher had checkmated him. In fact, Fisher's unorthodox tactics had completely unnerved his opponent. At the end of the game, Fisher leaped up and rushed out, yelling to his confederates as he smashed a fist into his palm, I am crushing him with brute force. In the next games, Fisher pulled moves that no one had seen from him before, moves that were not his style. Now Spassky started to make blunders. After losing the sixth game, he started to cry. One grandmaster said, after this, Spassky's got to ask himself if it's safe to go back to Russia. After the eighth game, Spassky decided he knew what was happening. Bobby Fischer was hypnotizing him. He decided not to look Fischer in the eye. He lost anyway. After the fourteenth game, he called a staff conference and announced, an attempt is being made to control my mind. He wondered whether the orange juice they drank at the chess table could have been drugged. Maybe chemicals were being blown into the air. Finally, Spassky went public, accusing the Fisher team of putting something in the chairs that was altering Spassky's mind. The KGB went on alert. Boris Spassky was embarrassing the Soviet Union. The chairs were taken apart and x-rayed. A chemist found nothing unusual in them. The only things anyone found anywhere, in fact were two dead flies in the lighting fixture. Spassky began to complain of hallucinations. He tried to keep playing, but his mind was unraveling. He could not go on. On September 2nd, he resigned. Although still relatively young, he never recovered from this defeat. Interpretation In previous games between Fisher and Spassky, Fisher had not fared well. Spassky had an uncanny ability to read his opponent's strategy and use it against him. Adaptable and patient, he would build attacks that would defeat not in seven moves, but in seventy. He defeated Fisher every time they played, because he saw much further ahead, and because he was a brilliant psychologist who never lost control. One master said, he doesn't just look for the best move, he looks for the move that will disturb the man he is playing. Fisher, however, finally understood that this was one of the keys to Spassky's success. He played on your predictability, defeated you at your own game. Everything Fisher did for the championship match was an attempt to put the initiative on his side and to keep Spassky off balance. Clearly, the endless waiting had an effect on Spassky's psyche. Most powerful of all, though, were Fisher's deliberate blunders and his appearance of having no clear strategy. In fact, he was doing everything he could to scramble his old patterns, even if it meant losing the first match and forfeiting the second. Spassky was known for his sang-froid and level-headedness, but for the first time in his life, he could not figure out his opponent. He slowly melted down, until at the end, he was the one who seemed insane. Chess contains the concentrated essence of life. First, because to win, you have to be supremely patient and far-seeing. And second, because the game is built on patterns, whole sequences of moves that have been played before and will be played again with slight alterations in any one match. Your opponent analyzes the patterns you are playing and uses them to try to foresee your moves allowing him nothing predictable to base his strategy on, gives you a big advantage. In chess, as in life, when people cannot figure out what you are doing, they are kept in a state of terror, waiting, uncertain, confused. Keys to Power Nothing is more terrifying than the sudden and unpredictable. That is why we are so frightened by earthquakes and tornadoes. We do not know when they will strike. After one has occurred, we wait in terror for the next one. To a lesser degree, this is the effect that unpredictable human behavior has on us. Animals behave in set patterns, which is why we are able to hunt and kill them. Only man has the capacity consciously to alter his behavior, to improvise and overcome the weight of routine and habit. Yet, most men do not realize this power. They prefer the comforts of routine, of giving in to the animal nature that has them repeating the same compulsive actions time and time again. 
They do this because it requires no effort and because they mistakenly believe that if they do not unsettle others, they will be left alone. Understand, a person of power instills a kind of fear by deliberately unsettling those around him to keep the initiative on his side. You sometimes need to strike without warning to make others tremble when they least expect it. It is a device that the powerful have used for centuries. Unpredictability is most often the tactic of the master, but the underdog too can use it to great effect. If you find yourself outnumbered or cornered, throw in a series of unpredictable moves. Your enemies will be so confused that they will pull back or make a tactical blunder. People are always trying to read the motives behind your actions and to use your predictability against you. Throw in a completely inexplicable move and you put them on the defensive. Because they do not understand you, they are unnerved, and in such a state you can easily intimidate them. Unpredictability is not only a weapon of terror. Scrambling your patterns on a day-to-day -day basis will cause a stir around you and stimulate interest. People will talk about you, ascribe motives and explanations that have nothing to do with the truth, but that keep you constantly in their minds. In the end, the more capricious you appear, the more respect you will garner. Only the terminally subordinate act in a predictable manner.